Welcome to The Real Deal, where we get real about what it takes to succeed. Whether it's wealth, health, relationships, or finding your purpose, we talk to the masters to uncover the secrets to defying the odds and creating your own rock star legacy. I'm Doug, and after working on multiple Grammy-winning records as an author, transformational speaker, and your personal translightenment coach, I'm committed to your growth and success. And now, here's the real deal. All right, so welcome. And before we begin, and before your epic intro, which will likely be the second best introduction you've had all day, uh, (laughs) because I don't know how many you've had already. And, uh, but before we begin, we do have to honor the sponsor. I sponsor myself. So in full disclosure, I'm going to be doing my own ad right now. (laughs) Are you feeling stressed out, perhaps overwhelmed by trepidation and anxiety? Then go ahead to guidedhypnotic.com and download your free guided hypnotic meditation and bust your anxiety once and for all. That's guidedhypnotic.com. All right, so cool. I'm yeah, psyched the, already. I yeah, get all right. Some guided hypnotic. Did I already put you in trance? That's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, the day's early. All right, so we have such a treat today. Um, I have been blessed to um, meet you years ago at uh, some Tony Robbins events, Business Mastery, and you crush it every time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary speaker and brilliant man. So if you don't know. David Meerman Scott spotted the real-time marketing revolution in its infancy and wrote five books about it, including The New Rules of Marketing and PR, with more than 400,000 copies sold in English and available in 29 languages from Albanian to Vietnamese. Now, David says the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of superficial online communications. Tech-weary and bot-weary, people are hungry for true human connection. Organizations have learned to win by developing what David calls a fanocracy, the subject of his Wall Street Journal bestseller. Tapping into the mindset, the relationships with customers are more important than the products they sell to them. He has a massive li- he is a massive live music fan, having been to 790 live shows since he was 15 years old. He is passionate about the Apollo Lunar Program, and he loves to surf, but isn't very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. Yeah, I think you uh, said that in one breath, Doug. It's good to see you. You too. Thank you for having, thank you for having me on. Uh, the, yeah, the, it was Tony. Tony Robbins is quite the amazing man, isn't he? Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, having uh, that—that's where my my start in life was. Uh, my just started listening to Personal Power and decided okay. to forego college and go into my career in music. So we uh, nice. let's chat about that. My worked on multiple Grammy winning records and uh, have had uh, my first career was production, performance, writing, everything. And then I moved on to work with Tony and help people make music of their lives. Yeah, Um, awesome. So it's been incredible. So share with us right now, like who you are and what makes you so passionate about creating these raving fans. And uh, Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of, no pun intended, of that philosophy. So, yeah. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned in, in the, your kind introduction, this idea that I just love live music and bummed out that we can't watch live music right now um, yeah. because I don't know any venues that are open and I don't want to go to a drive-in the- movie theater to watch live music. Thank you very much. I, Not quite. I like being up, up close and personal, but I've been to um, you know, 800 live shows in my life, 75 Grateful Dead concerts, my biggest, biggest live music um, fandoms. And so I, um, I just, why am I such a massive live music geek? What the hell is going on here? And I started talking to my daughter, Reiko. She's now 27, but this was five years ago. You know, we were talking like, you know, it's crazy. I'm, I'm a huge fan of live music and she is too. But then she started to talk about Harry Potter. She's uh-huh. a massive Harry Potter fan. Not only has she read every book multiple times, seen every movie multiple times, gone to the wizarding world of Harry Potter theme 
Park in Orlando several times. She wrote an 85,000 word alternative ending to the Harry Potter series where Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix. Put that on a fan fiction site. It's been downloaded thousands of times, oh commented God. on hundreds of times. So, right? Ma massive Harry Potter geek. Um, and also, Rake was really into Comic-Con. Um, nice. And so, um, we talk, and that's her in the middle, by the way. Um, so, sure. so, she and I talked a lot about this idea of fandom. And we decided, you know, we should collaborate. We should collaborate on this idea of what is fandom? How does it work? Let's dig into the neuroscience aspects of fandom. Um, let's interview people about what they're a fan of. Let's interview companies that have developed fandoms. Um, and all of these ideas were running around in our head of the things that we wanted to do. Um, so it eventually became this book, and which came out in early 2020 called Fanocracy, turning fans into customers and customers into fans. It's right here. But my daughter and I, made a crazy cool team because not only are we sh do we share different fandoms and for me live music surfing uh, for her going to comic-con and harry potter but obviously we're different generations i'm her mm -hmm. dad obviously we're different genders um she's half japanese my wife um, yukari is um uh, we met in tokyo reiko was born in tokyo uh, yeah. and um while i um you know, I did okay in school, but I never went beyond university. Reiko um, graduated from medical school this year, and she's now an emergency room doctor at Boston Medical Center um, going through her residency program. So she's got the brains in the family. Um, and so we were a perfect team to write this book because... Yeah. And she did a neuroscience undergraduate degree at Columbia University. So she, so she came out with like an academic bent and a and a, and a neuroscience I bent and, and, and a medical idea of, you know, what's going on in our brains and all that. And I came at from just like, geez, hey, this is fun stuff. Let's figure this out. <laughs> and so, so we spent five years working on this and it wow. was great. It was great because it brought us together in a really cool and interesting way. But we learned a ton about this idea of fandom. And our buddy Tony Robbins wrote the forward to the book, which is also super cool. So cool. I'm really excited about it. It, it. it came out in January, debuted on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So pretty happy about the yeah. results that it's achieved so far. Did you ever uh, take her to any concerts? Like, the, was she any oh, dead tons. shows or that? Oh, or that? Yeah, yeah, tons. Uh, the first show I took her to, she was seven years old. And it was um, uh, epic for me because it was my college bands. It was the, um, the B-52s, the Go-Go's, and the Tom-Tom mm -hmm. Club. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just a uh, cool, triple, cool triple bill. And she was only seven. And um, she had heard the music in the car and whatnot, so she knew the songs and and it was great. It was great. And, and all along, you know, when she was young, um, the first show she chose to go to was Pink. Okay. She might have been nine or 10, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, it was super cool to go to shows. And, and we still go together. The most recent would have been the Raconteurs. Oh, wow. Um, who we, who we both love <laughs> and we saw them in a club in Boston, the house of blues in Boston. And, um, uh, that would have been probably, it was this year, probably January, February, something like that okay. before COVID, obviously. So how, while you were doing that and, and sort of watching her develop and, and creating the, the use, I guess, of all, I mean, having dad being, you know, the understanding marketing and, and all of that. And she obviously took a different, different path. I'm sure she's still, obviously, we're able to apply some of the things that she had learned from you to succeed in creating, you know, obviously that the, the Harry Potter book and, and that level of connection. And how did you see her adopt to the technology because it was more second nature to her because she grew up with it, whereas, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you know, you had a different paradigm shift. You know, what, what, what strikes me as the most interesting about the path that she has forged, 
which was partly my influence and also partly my wife's influence because mm-hmm. my wife my wife is also a writer mm-hmm. um, she's written I believe seven or eight books I, I can't read them because she writes in the Japanese language <laughs> Wow um, and she's the uh, US correspondent for Newsweek Japan and has some other columns that she writes so Reiko grew up in a household where um, both of both her parents were authors our authors. Um, we had tons of books always in the house. So she grew up as a reader. Um, and then she grew up to be a doctor, which she is right now. She's in her first month of, of being a doctor, being a resident. And what she, um, what she did, which, um, which is so, so super cool, is she loves, loves the combination of literary things, literature, and medicine. Now, there's a very, very specific concept called narrative medicine, which um, developed out of Columbia University at the time that she was an undergraduate at Columbia University, and she studied neuroscience as an undergraduate. But she took a bunch of courses and dug into this idea of narrative medicine. The basic idea of narrative medicine is that if you understand the whole patient, and you understand the patient's narrative, in other words, their life story, that you can um, have a much better relationship with that patient and be a much better caregiver to that patient than if you're just getting the symptoms of what's Mm -hmm. your blood pressure and what does your blood work show. Um, And so she just dug into this because she understands narrative because she's a writer and a reader. She understands people's stories because she writes stories. She participates in stories like, uh, you know, like going to Comic-Con dressed up and and so on. Uh, And um, and so she just dug deep into this idea of narrative medicine. And um, in, in the book Fanocracy that we wrote together, she, she shares the story of a patient. She calls Jeremy, it's obviously a pseudonym, but Jeremy is um, an older gentleman. He's in his, I believe he's in his 80s. He um, was very, very sick. Um, and um, facing a terminal diagnosis. And Reiko spoke with him for a long time to learn his story, to understand his narrative, to understand who he is as a person, not just his symptoms. And what she learned when she did that was that he is an artist and he's actually does interesting sculptures, amateur, not a professional, interesting Mm -hmm. sculpture at his home studio. And eventually, after they were chatting for some number of minutes, Jeremy said to my daughter, Reiko, she said, he said, you know, you doctors just want to keep me alive. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that's what your work is. But I don't want to be alive any longer than I can um, actually practice my artwork and do my sculpture. Mm -hmm. If you can help me to continue to do art for another couple of months, that's my goal. I don't want to be in a hospital bed. So that's how I want my care to be given. And she told me that, has, and we, she wrote in the book, as uh, if she hadn't drawn him out, if she hadn't discussed with him what his narrative is, that she never would have figured that out. And she may have, um, she and other doctors, and at the time she wasn't yet a doctor, she and other doctors would have made different decisions about his care. But because she dug into his narrative and understood her, his story could devise a different way of treating him. And now she's on the front lines of COVID and, you know, using this concept of narrative medicine is a really important concept. Um, and, um, and so I think it's just super cool that she's coming at her profession of a, being an emergency department doctor from the perspective of understanding stories and understanding narrative. And so much so that she now teaches a class at Boston University School of Medicine on on narrative medicine. So she's helping to educate new uh, doctors in training about this concept. Wow. I mean, that's so, that's profound uh, because. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, as as you were sharing that with me and, and, 
as he, you were sharing, I was kind of putting myself in that position, you know, kind of like, well, how would I feel if I'm like into my days and, and all that? And, and I'm, I'm a big storyteller. I'm all about that as being part of our journey. And mm-hmm. that ultimately is what we, we really want is continuing our story. Right. And through yeah. his art or through, you know, how, it's like, how, what is our legacy going to be? And what a, a powerful way to approach medicine by really looking at the, the human, not the pathology, not the, right. you know, the symptoms, obviously, you know, symptomology right. or woundology is, is a whole other science that is heartless and without, you know, obviously, hopefully behind that there is a heart, but right. yeah. Being yeah. Too- and, and, um, and clearly depending on the patient, depending on the problem, you know, sometimes you can't do that. If someone comes in with a gunshot wound, you can't ask them <laughs> about their narrative, right? You know, you have to deal with a gunshot wound. Um, but, um, but I just think it's uh, just such an interesting approach. And then, and then, so we look at this idea of narrative medicine um, beyond just medicine. The idea mm-hmm. of narrative can help to uh, help all kinds of businesses to do a better job at understanding their customers, to do a better job at understanding their um, potential customers and serving their marketplace. Uh, and so, um, you know, this, the whole idea of a kinder and gentler approach to business is something that I'm a huge believer in. And, and I think especially during our current pandemic, that that's an approach that, that tends to work for the companies that are able to do it. Because, you know, just buy my product, buy my product, buy my product, beat you over the head. It doesn't work in a situation when, you know, people are facing difficulties. And so how can an organization, how can a person have a kinder and gentler approach to business? And one of the examples that I love, I actually wrote about it on my blog a couple of weeks ago, um, comes from a company called Duracell. And you probably mm-hmm. know Duracell because yeah. they do they do batteries, famous for doing batteries. And there's another, this is another example that's in our book, Fanocracy, because what Duracell has done Um, over the last roughly nearly a decade is they have a program called Power Forward. Power Forward, they provide free batteries to people in need. And originally the program was devised for uh, victims of natural disaster, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, things like that. Um, Times when there's a power outage. So when there's a power outage, they they have a fleet of, I think there's six now vehicles that they can deploy quickly to the place where there's the power outage. And they distribute literally hundreds of thousands of free batteries to people in need who have that power outage. Now you can imagine if, um, you know, you, 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 I think you live in Florida and there's hurricanes in yeah. Florida. You can imagine a hurricane come through and your power is out for three, four, five, six days a week. And, you know, you've got batteries in that flashlight, but they go, it goes dead after one or two nights. Yep. You go to the store and the batteries are all gone. What the heck are you going to do? And there's the Duracell truck giving free batteries, no obligation whatsoever. You don't have to fill out any forms. You don't have to sign anything. Here's your battery. Here's your battery. Here's your batteries. What kind do you want? Double A's. Here you go. You need some D's. Here you go. Um, and they're giving them away. But during COVID, what they recognized is that there are several things where they could help, where Duracell could help with Power Forward. Um, first of all, is first responders and healthcare professionals. Many of the, um, the machines that they use are battery operated and they're running out quickly because they have more work than they normally do. So they're giving away batteries to first responders and um, healthcare workers. But then they found something, and, and by the way, get this, 10 million batteries so far given away during COVID. 10 wow million batteries. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Most businesses look at this as a sales opportunity. Oh, COVID, people need batteries. We can make a whole lot of money. Duracell said, no, let's give them away to people who truly need them and and don't have them and and are, are in a cash crunch. The second thing they did, which I think is brilliant, is Duracell also makes um, power charging stations for smartphones. Mm. It's a product, it's a product they sell. You could buy the power, power power charging station. But what they recognized a very big need in the 
waiting rooms for family members of people in hospitals because all of a sudden, if one of your family members um, gets sick, it happens quickly with COVID. And you've got to like, maybe you call the ambulance or maybe you take them in your car, but you race to the hospital. Um, I think my wife has COVID. They bring them in and they the family member often will go to a special waiting room. Frequently, it's not the normal waiting room. It's a temporary thing set up in a tent somewhere or whatever. They recognize that then people will go there. They'll grab their cell phone as they're running out of the house. They've got their mobile phone and they're trying to text their relatives and other people who need to know what's going on. The mobile phone batteries drain. And so these mobile power station, uh, charging stations Duracell has put into the family waiting rooms of hospitals around the country. Again, totally for free, no obligation, you know, plug in your phone, we're here to help. Of course, people see the Duracell brand and that's why that's a, a very right. huge benefit for Duracell is because now they're seen as a company that's helpful. They're seen as a company mm-hmm. that's providing a valuable resource. It's a kinder and gentler approach to business. They, instead of um, giving away 10 million batteries and thousands of phone chargers, what they could have done is spent that money to run advertisements. Hey, you're out of, you know, you're, you, you, need, you need batteries, buy some Duracells because COVID is here, you know, and that's what so many companies are doing, but Dura, Duracell has taken a different approach. So, you know, I love that kind of thing of ways to build fans in a business, mm-hmm. unusual ways, even during uh, the pandemic, people who are clever, clever and creative and, we spoke with their vice president of marketing um, and um, what he told us, uh, his name is R- Ramon Valentini. What Ramon told us is that this is just the perfect program for us because we're all about providing power. We're not about selling batteries. We're about providing power. And if we can provide power during a pandemic, people remember that. Yeah. They remember that sometimes for the rest of their lives and are loyal to Duracell every time they need to buy new batteries. That is huge. And I love that distinction right there as well, that they're, they don't sell batteries. They provide power, which is for some, they might go, ah, what's, you know, it, it may be semantic, but the truth is that is tremendously powerful, pun intended. Yeah because that's uh, having a deeper understanding and it gives them more flexibility in their approach. So their mission, vision, value statement obviously includes power, includes empowering, includes support, all of that. And then they're congruent. And then that's how they create raving fans because they then feel empowered by Duracell. And then, yeah. I love that. Right. right. No, it's fabulous, isn't it? It's really, I, love, I love it too. It's, um, it, it's, it's an organization that's managed to pivot in a kind and gentle way um, that's just truly helpful to people as opposed to so many organizations that I've seen out there that are just simply looking to exploit the situation. So is that part of the work that you do besides obviously speaking and authoring and blogging, like as a a consultant, is that some of the work that you do where you come in and and do that sort of unpacking and and say, okay, how could we position it in a more kinder, heartfelt, uh, gentler way to kind of like a velvet hammer? Because I mean, that's, that's, it's heavy. Velvet, velvet, ha- velvet hammer is a really interesting metaphor. Um, I, I do not do any consulting. Okay. Um, I do a little bit of coaching, um, helping people to implement the ideas that I talk about. Um, but most of my work is, uh, in a, is in a few areas. I do, uh, I write books, obviously. Um, I give presentations um, up until very recently. They've all been Uh, in-person presentations. And as you know, I speak at all of Tony Robbins Business Mastery events, for example, uh, around the world. Um, And and so now those have gone virtual. So do virtual presentations. I do serve on advisory boards of companies. Typically that's for equity, not cash, Mm -hmm. um, for ongoing uh, advisory work. Um, but, um, uh, I, but I don't do any sort of traditional consulting where I sign a contract with a company and help them. Um, um, I do what I call coaching. The difference is 
coaching is helping them to do the work. Right. Whereas I see a lot of times consulting is you do the work as the consultant. So, right. Yeah. Um, so that. the approach I take is I'm happy to coach you through to the answer, uh, but I'm not going to provide the answer for you. So when this whole COVID thing happened, you obviously had speaking engagements lined up, you had book tours, you had all of those things. Yeah. How did you like, what was the first thing that kind of went through your mind when this all thing started to happen? You saw the writing on the wall, but you know, we don't know oh, what's going to, geez, where's this going to be next? And the first thing that went through my mind is I can't be with my friends at, at rock shows anymore. <laughs> um, and oh, oh my God, that's terrible. I haven't been to a, a live concert now. And I think for, I think the last one was, early March. So however many months that is pretty long time. And I, and I can't give live speeches anymore either. That's awful too. So, um, so those are the things that were quickly going through my mind. And so I realized, I realized this though, um, that as org, as events need to pivot from being a lot, being a, an in-person event to going virtual, people will need to have help to make that transition. That's what I realized very early on. And I recognize that I have an opportunity to help people to do that. Uh, and the reason that I had an opportunity to help people do that is because I understand deeply how um, online business works, how online marketing works, online content works. Um, I literally have been um, working with online content in my career, in, for my entire career, 35 years. My very first job was on a bond trading desk in New York City, where I used the Dow Jones and Reuters screens to do my work. And I loved the new real-time news, real-time data that was in those screens that bond traders used much better than I liked being a bond trader. So then I worked for 15 years in the real-time news business. Mm. Um, I, I lived in Tokyo for seven years, Hong Kong for two years, working for companies like Dow Jones and Thomson Reuters to um, uh, create, market, and sell real-time news and data services. So that then in 1995, when the internet came, um, uh, the, the web came, I already knew what was going on. And for most people, it was brand new. And that's why I had what I always consider an unfair head start um, on what is marketing on the web. And I, I wrote a book in 2007 called The New Rules of Marketing and PR that was the very first book to describe how marketing is done and public relations is done on the web, all about creating great content. Um, that was pre-social networks, pre-Twitter, and, mm. and, and I wrote it pre-Facebook and all that. Um, but at that time, it was blogs and other uh, and websites and other tools that you can create. And now, of course, we've got the social media revolution. So right. I understood the idea of how does a business trans transition from offline to online, because I've been doing it and talking right. about it for quite literally more than 30 years. Um, so I thought deeply, how do businesses take their in-person events and create virtual events from them? Um, and I recognize very quickly that they're different. Just, just like advertising agencies completely missed the online marketing revolution, and they missed them because they were they were coming at it from the perspective of a paid banner ads mm. that didn't work so well, right? Yep. Um, whereas I argued it's not about paid banner ads. You advertising agencies are all dead wrong. This is about content creation, and it turns out I was right; they were wrong. Um, so I think the same thing is true right now. This is not about taking an in-person event and and then transferring it to an online world. Instead, it's a reimagination of mm. what's possible in an online world. So an in-person event is theatrical, 
right? right? What I do, what I do as a speaker on a stage, what Tony Robbins does as a speaker on a stage, what other good speakers do as a speaker on the stage is they deliver a theatrical performance. Mm -hmm. There's an, a physical audience in the room. There's a physical stage. Um, and it's um, a, com a communications that's theatrical. A virtual event is not theatrical. A virtual event is more like television. Mm. And so it's a really different concept. As well, in a f in person event, the audience interaction is very, very important, both from the stage, how you interact because you can see the audience members but also uh, before and after the presentation at um, a meal break or, mm -hmm. or the cocktail reception or, um, um, or just in the hallway of the convention center. Very important aspects of an in-person event. How can you figure out to, how to do the same thing in a virtual event? So I thought deeply about all of those things. I also thought about the best way to present. And so many people who I've seen present at virtual events take their notebook computer, put it on their dining room table, <laughs> and then, you know, aim it. It's, I call it the nostril shot, right? right. Aim, it up there, aim it up their nose and then up, um, up on, I'll, I'll demonstrate a nostril shot for you. Okay. And then it's, a, it's, it's up on the lights above them. So, right. um, <laughs> okay, so, so this is a nostril shot. Yep. And, they, and they present like this with the lights up in the background, up through their nose. But what I did is I reimagined it. I reimagined. So I've got a, you know, like you, I've got a great yep. microphone. I've got some lights. Um, I've got the computer I'm presenting from here. I have a secondary computer here that's driving my slides over my shoulder. Yep. And then I've got a... Um, uh, a virtual, uh, it's, it's a real wall, but it, I purpose built this wall so that I have a nice, interesting background. Yep. So now what I've been able to do here is I present standing up, which yep. is better for the voice, mm -hmm. better for projecting, better for gestures, better for many different things. So I can present standing up. I've got my slides over my shoulder, which is really interesting because what that means is that the Almost every virtual event platform, when you show slides through the platform, the slides are enormous and the picture of the speaker is a little tiny postage stamp. Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought to myself, how can I reimagine how to show some images, yeah. but do it in a way that I don't become a little post postage stamp David <laughs> yeah. in the corner. And Love the way I figured that out is just create a studio in my home where I've got a screen to present from that's over my shoulder. And then if I need that to go blank, I can make it go blank mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so on. So that seemed to work really. I'm going to make it go blank uh, with a different color now. So that seems to work really well for me. And it was simply reimagining what's possible, not copying that in-person event mm -hmm. and putting it on uh, an, an in-person presentation and putting it online, um, not doing it from your dining room table with a nostril shot, right. but instead thinking, how can I build a studio that will be ideal for when I present um, at events where I'm doing it from my studio. And I also have relationships with, with professional studios in Boston for the full blown effect, right. you know, multiple cameras and big fat studios. And I presented at those several times, which is, which is a, a step up, but it means that the conference organizer has to pay extra to not only my speaking fee, but also the, the fee for the uh, thing. So I've been um, advising dozens, literally dozens and dozens of, of, of event planners on how to do their events. And I don't charge anything for that. I happy to get on the phone, provide some advice. And I'm, you know, I say, I hope you invite me to speak, but it's cool. If you don't, I'm happy mm -hmm. to help you to plan your, your virtual event. And, um, you know, using tools like the polling features, the chat features, Q and a, 
um, having some surprises, you know, all kinds of the different things that I've learned are very helpful during this. So, so that's what I've been able to do to reimagine and reinvent myself yeah. <laughs> um, during this situation. And I'm actually quite enjoying it. You know, I always, I've always loved to travel. I'm cool with it, but it's kind of nice not to have gotten on an airplane since the month of March. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting how people get conditioned to, I guess, whether it's always in travel live and now we're finding new ways that I think, you know, moving forward, the hybrid situation is going to be pretty amazing yeah. because I, I agree with, I totally agree with you. I believe hybrid in the future, once we are able to do in-person mm-hmm. events, well, and by the way, whether that's music or theater or dance um, mm-hmm. or, or um, events, you know, speaking engagements, um, I think that hybrid will become a very viable option. Um, you know, there's so many people, I mean, let's just take Tony Robbins, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, Tony Robbins does his UPW, Unleash the Power Within, events in three or four or five cities in a given year. I think yep. usually it's done in Europe at least once, a couple mm-hmm. of times in different cities in North America. Um, uh, often he'll do one in Australia. And there might be one in, in another place, perhaps South America. But if you live in, say, Pakistan, <laughs> there is no UPW that's Happen. nearby you. Um, but so, so a, a, a combination hybrid live allows people who, who both can afford as well as f- for whom it's convenient can travel to be there live in the same room as Tony, which yep. in the case of UPW is a basketball arena. Mm-hmm. Um, or um, perhaps if you're located in a, in, a, in, a, in a country or you don't have the financial resources to travel to an, in, uh, an in-person event, you can still participate in a virtual way. So I think you're right. I think a hybrid approach is what's going to happen. And, and the benefit to that as well is I, I believe the support Whereas now I think people are more used to, they're, they're giving it value that there's an engagement on screen mm-hmm. time and there's an investment. So someone could go to a UPW or business mastery or whatever and have some follow-ups that are valuable where it's not just like, right. oh yeah, I get a webinar, or, you know, a Zoom call or whatever. Right. Right. And it didn't have the same weight as yeah. it did. Yeah, I think that's right. I also think what's really, really important that we're all trying to figure out right now. I mean, I don't, I'm not perfect, but I've been able to dial into this to a certain degree. Uh, Tony and his team have been able to dial into it in a big way as well. Is how do you make a, a virtual event interactive? Right. Right. Because um, nobody wants to sit there passively and watch a screen as if they're binge watching Breaking Bad for six, for six days, right? Yeah. Uh, they want it to be interactive. They want to engage with other people who are at the event. They want to engage with, uh, with the people who are speaking. They want to be able to have different experiences rather than just um, have that be a one-way broadcast television-like experience. Yeah. Um, but how can it become two-way? So that's the challenge that we all face. And there's tons of ways that, that interactivity can be built into it, but it means you know completely reimagining what's possible. Well, and it was interesting, I think, on the other side as a speaker, um, the fact that, uh, and you'll experience it, I'm sure, with uh, Business Mastery is um, for the UPW, I'm sure you've seen the studio that Tony created. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yeah. you'll feel the audience the other way because so that it's right. not just like I'm sitting in front of the camera and trying to create a, an energy. There is some reciprocation. Yeah, that's reciprocation. right. That's right. Yeah, I, um, I participated in um, UPW over this past weekend and had a chance to see him live in that studio go, you know, go, th- I, I wasn't physically there, but I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. as a participant. Um, and it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish. You know, he's like uh, raised the bar for everybody about what a virtual event can be. Yeah. God bless him. And that bastard, right? Cause that makes <laughs> it like, he's got the resources, the energy, everything is like, Oh, great. Now, how are we going to compete with Tony on that level? No, um, I, I, I don't, I don't agree with that because I think, um, I think what w- w- Tony and his team are both, Tony is the presenter and his team is the um, organizer. 
Right. Speakers like me, I don't run my own events. I'm only, mm-hmm. I speak at other people's events. I don't run my own events. So for us, it's like, I can do whatever you want. You want me to present from my home studio? It's kind of, it's okay. It's not perfect. It's small. It's simple. Um, but it does the trick. You mm-hmm. want me to go to a studio, my, the studio that I have a relationship with in Boston? You know, that's going to cost you, you know, $15,000 extra to rent that studio for me to present from. Or if you really want to make it an amazing experience, build your own studio somewhere. And um, as long as I can do it safely, I'll, I can get myself there. And, um, and so I think in the case of Tony, um, it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish. He and his team, absolutely fabulous. Uh, and, um, you know, I hope to be able to present in that, um, in that stage, at, or that, that virtual stage at some point. Um, but, but because he both runs his own events and speaks at his events, he has a different business model than somebody like me who speaks only at other people's events. Right. Well, I, I was referring to uh, people who have to, who they do their own events, you know, people like me. Right. Or, yeah. Or, oh, uh, yeah. Right. And I'm right. like, okay. And I see other, I coach a lot of speakers and coaches and, and people who do their own events and obviously on a, a smaller scale. Um, yeah. And it's, it, it, you know, you see that and it's like, wow, that's like, you know, it, it's entering a race and someone's got the, you know, the McLaren it's, it's, and you're it's, like uh, in your Toyota Prius. And pretty, like, you know. pretty amazing. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's so inspiring, though, because I think that the great news is, is that it's opening up more possibilities for people because now it's becoming right. the normal, right? Marshall Silver yeah. just announced he's doing his Turning Point virtual. Uh, I'm going to be rolling out our speaker trainings virtual, which I was concerned about because like, ah, there's that, that interaction that it's just, it's a so vital. Um, and I guess there was that romantic in me thinking, ah, oh, it's, this is all going to wash over soon. We'll be, we'll be uh, live no time. And uh, yeah, I, I actually slowly. thought the same, I, I thought the same thing. I, I, I thought we might be out for six months, but no, I, it's way into 2021 before in-person yeah. events come back, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I thank you so much. I know that you've got some time you know, to, to uh, prepare for your next thing. I really honor your, your time, your wisdom. Is there anything that you'd last final words? And also, how can people get in touch with you, hire you, uh, get your books, um, and, and really just dig in deeper to everything that you do? Because what you're doing is amazing. Oh, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, a couple of places. Um, to learn more about this book, Fanocracy, Turning Fans into Customers and Customers into Fans, I wrote with my daughter, Reiko. Um, we've got a, a website at fanocracy.com, www.fanocracy.com. There's tons of um, free information there that you can check out, download videos and whatnot. Um, on most of the social networks, I am DM Scott. That's D-M-S-C-O-T-T. So Twitter, Instagram and whatnot, that's how you can reach me. Uh, and my full name, David Meerman Scott. If you Google me, I'm the only one on the planet. So you'll find <laughs> my site. You'll find other things about me that way. Is that your real name or uh, did you? Yeah, Meerman, Meer, Meerman is my middle name. And uh, more than 20 years ago, um, I, I set up my first website and um, it's probably almost 25 years ago. And so I, um, Google didn't exist, but I did a search on whatever was Alta Vista, I think, for David okay, Scott. Yeah. And yeah, that, that dates, date, dates us, right? If we remember <laughs> Alta Vista. Yeah. And um, so I did a search for David Scott and turned out there was a David Scott who walked on the moon uh, as commander of Apollo 15. I knew that. There's a David Scott who was a who uh, is a, was a, at the time was a famous Ironman triathlon champion. And there's a David Scott who's a member of Congress from Georgia. Uh, uh, so there's three famous David Scotts and other, other David Scotts that came up on the search. And I realized um, I, I'm not going to break through on that search anytime soon. So my middle name is Meerman, M-E-E-R-M-A-N. It's a Dutch family name. Uh, part of my family came from Dordrecht in the Netherlands. So mm-hmm. I just started using my middle name professionally. And it was one of the best business decisions I ever made 
because everybody knows me professionally as David Nierman Scott. And it's, you know, if you do a search, it's only me. If you go to Amazon, you look for David Nierman Scott, it's only me. You know, it's, it's really, and people remember it. They won't remember yeah. David Scott. It's like two really common names, two for, you know, never trust a man who has two first names is what they say. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, and I think a little bit, you've done the same with Doug as D-U-G. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's not a normal spelling, and I think I'm, I'm only guessing, but my imagine I'm imagining that probably helps you with search engine optimization as well. Yeah, anybody who has an unusual spelling of their name and so on. Yeah, and believe it or not, it started out when I was a teen for video games because uh, you only do three letters, so oh, I that's started it. But then I saw it sticking out, and then professionally, when I got into music, it was just Doug, D-U-G. I didn't even use my last name. Okay, yeah. Um, and that was a way to, again, it was a way to stand out. And I wasn't yet thinking internet and all of that. Yeah. It was just a way for you know my album credits and all that to, to yeah. stick out. But it certainly has helped. Um, yeah. in, right, in that right. Sense. I, I met, when I, I met Billy Joel, uh, I was, I was you know, doing music all the time. We were recording some of his, his works. And uh, he's like, Doug, D-U-G, because if... My name was Doug. I'd spell it that way too. He's like, yeah, that's cool. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, God bless him. Uh, well, dude, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Thank that you. We can support you. Uh, please, you know, my resources are your resources. Um, Appreciate you know, that. I'm super excited to have this opportunity to to spread the love, as it were. And as uh, as, as as am I. I enjoyed the conversation very much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I love you for who you are and who you aren't and uh, crush your next meeting and uh, we will be in touch very short. Thanks, Doug. All, All right. good. Peace. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for stopping by and hanging with us and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast right here and We look forward to serving you even more. Remember, download your free guided hypnotic meditation at guidedhypnotic.com. That's guidedhypnotic.com where you'll get your free anxiety-busting meditation. We look forward to serving you, and if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to reach out. All right, we love you for who you are and who you aren't. God bless.